Um, good evening. Uh, this is a meeting of the Northampton Public Works Commission. Uh, today is Wednesday, September 16th. It's 5.30 in the afternoon, and we are at the Northampton Senior Center. Uh, my name is Mike Parsons. I'm the chairman of the commission. Uh, as I look around, we have two commissioners here in addition to myself. That's not a quorum, um, so this we're going to continue. The primary purpose of this gathering is to um, inform the public of, of the work that the, the commission and the department are doing, uh, but this will not be an official public works commission meeting. Uh, uh, and as such, I think we'll skip uh, the formal public comment portion of the meeting. Um, as, as we go through the presentation tonight, because this is such a small group, we're gonna encourage people to ask questions as we go. Um, and then if you have questions at the end, you can certainly bring those up too. Um, and since uh, I'm assuming that you're all here for the review of the wastewater uh, report, uh, I think that's where we'll do a public comment. Um, I just wanted to point out that uh, the Board of Public Works, which was the predecessor board to our current Public Works Commission, and the Department of Public Works have been working on this project for several years now. Um, it's been a very comprehensive effort, and what we hope to convey um, is a, an understanding of the current condition of our system, and then what needs to be done to make it reliable so that it can handle both the current and future needs of the city. Um, and with that, um, I think I'll turn it over to Matt Huntley, the Director of the Public Works Department, who will um, introduce the speakers. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Uh, for those who didn't hear, my name is Matt Huntley, I'm Director of Public Works. Um, this is the first of two public meetings we're having on the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan. The next one is gonna be on September 30th at 6.30 p.m at the community room at uh, JFK School on Bridge Road. So that'll be the second and the final meeting on that. And we encourage the public to comment on this, on the plan. Um, the plan started several years ago with the city council authorizing the study to be done. Uh, we had a proposed plan that went to the uh, Department of Environmental Protection for concurrence. And the plan was bond funded by a bond by the Clean Water, um, Water State Revolving Fund. Uh, the plan was a multi-year study undertaken by a consultant, Kleinfelder, along insisted by DPW staff, the Public Works Commission, and the subcommittee of that. One of the department's goals was to create long-range plans for infrastructure for the city. This particular plan is to guide the department, the mayor, and the city council for future necessary improvements to the system and forecast both short and long-term capital plans. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Kleinfelder, David Peterson, and Dan Westgate for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. Thank you, Mike. Welcome, everybody. Um, so I did want to um, just let you know our plan is for this presentation to take about 40 minutes. I know we have about an hour scheduled, so there is plenty of time at the end for questions, but as Mike said, definitely interrupt us if you have any questions along the way. And um, we're happy to answer the best of our capacity tonight. <laughs> so uh, what we wanted to walk through is really, um, what was the process that we went through for the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan? What was the specific scope elements? And really emphasize what we learned in that process in terms of existing conditions of both, both the wastewater collection system and the wastewater treatment plant. And in that way, it was, you know, as we said, a very comprehensive study. What we've learned from the existing conditions, then we've identified some deficiencies, basically, things that need to be addressed over the long term. Our study covers a 20-year planning window, basically. So between now and 2035, those are, you know, kind of the, the issues we're trying to, to stem off and address. And so by, by looking at those deficiencies, we looked at a bunch of alternative ways to try to address those deficiencies and develop a capital plan, which would be, you know, how do we address those, what are the dollars involved, and, you know, how do we want to uh, move ahead with them. And then implementation is actually, you know, going ahead from this moment forward to actually do the, do the work going forward. So, in terms of the process, as I mentioned, there was a very uh, extensive existing conditions. We really had, um, you know, five major steps. We looked at the condition um, age of the wastewater collection system itself. 
how much hydraulic capacity there is relative to the flows that it's seen today and in the future. Um, infiltration inflow study, which I'll, I'll get to what those mean um, when we get to the slides. Um, an on-site wastewater needs assessment, which basically is um, areas of the city that are not currently sewer. We looked at the unsewered areas to see whether sewer is necessary uh, to meet long-term needs. And then the wastewater treatment facility. And, and Pam is, is going to cover the, the whole element of the, the facility once I've gone through the collection system. So then at the end here, it kind of is the, the same as the agenda. We basically just identified alternatives and determined what capital um, improvements are necessary to address deficiencies. So in terms of existing conditions of the wastewater um, collection system, uh, your collection system has about 110 miles of sewer pipes. That can get you from here all the way to Boston, so that's, which is actually where I drove in from tonight. So I know what it's like, it's a very long, it's a very long way. Um, there's 2,600 sewer manholes in the collection system. Every single one of them, the city owns, maintains, takes the grease out, and has to worry about it. Um, there are seven city-owned wastewater pump stations. These don't include um, privately owned and operated uh, pump stations. And there is, of course, a centralized wastewater treatment facility on Hockenham Road. Looking a little bit at the history of how uh, the wastewater collection system was developed in Northampton, if you, if you graph how many linear feet of sewer was installed in certain decades, you, you get something like this, which is, uh, it's kind of neat. I mean, I'm an engineer geek, so it's kind of neat to look at, but basically in the eight, 1880s, quite a bit of pipe was put in, um, and that was sort of concentrated in like the Leeds you know, area, Florence area, sort of the middle areas. But not a lot happens until the 1950s, and then um, really in the 1970s, which is when the Clean Water Act really came out, and the federal government had a lot of free money that cities took advantage of, including Northampton, to really put a lot of sewer pipe in the ground, uh, protect groundwater quality, protect receiving water quality. Um, and around that, around the same decade is when the, the treatment plant really got uh, expanded and, and going, and, and Pam will talk about that specifically. This graphic here is a distribution of the, the materials of the pipe that's in the ground today. And this is almost a result of the prior slides. So certain decades and certain time periods, engineers, contractors really depended on certain, different, certain types of materials. So each material really has its own uh, issues and problems and characteristics, and the city needs to be adept at dealing with, with all those types of materials. Um, one thing that I point out is this DCP, which is vitrified clay pipe, um, is you know, about 16% of the collection system is made of this stuff. and it's. Um, I find when we look at collection systems, BC pipe tends to be the first to crack, um, you know, break, be brittle. They have usually short lay lengths with a lot of joints, so they can be problematic. And that's not to say every other material has no issues, so um, just the BC is what I find to be problematic um, predominantly. So also we looked at the age and the condition of the major assets in the collection system. So that includes the pipe, the manholes, and the pump station. In terms of the age, uh, the city of Northampton's wastewater collection system is, is old. I mean, 1880s pipe. So if I were to assume that a pipe in the ground is supposed to last 75 years, 15% uh, of your collection system is older than that. By the end of our study, in 2035, 35%, uh, so a third of the system will be older than how long it's supposed to last. Um, so we have to know that. We've we we got to be cognizant and aware of that. In addition, the city has uh, it utilizes its own equipment to actually put cameras into the sewers and take a look at their condition. Uh, that was not part of uh, Kleinfelder's study. We didn't, we didn't study the internal condition exhaustively, but the city does perform its own inspections. In terms of manholes, uh, we opened up uh, about 20% of the manholes in the city and found them to actually be in pretty good structural condition, which was a great sign. We did find uh, grease to be an issue in a lot of locations around the town. Uh, which the, the town does have a very targeted grease uh, cleanings uh, program. And with pump stations, uh, the city owns, like as I said, seven pump stations, which is great. It's actually a pretty small number of pump stations for a <coughs> city of this size, a collection city of this size. Uh, however, four of them are older than 37 years old, and they're also pretty problematic and, and somewhat dangerous, really, to get inside. It's a confined space. Um, all the pumps are underground. So uh, those are our stations that are of concern that we want to um, make sure we, we take a look at rehabbing or replacing. 
Uh, two of the pump stations are older than 25 years old. And I would say that those are you know, at their, approaching the end of their really design life. So in the 20 year planning period, we do want to take a look at, at addressing those as well. In 2011, the Bradford Street uh, pump station uh, was replaced, and so that's, that's in you know, pretty good condition today. Um, it's not heavily featured you know, in the 20 year planning study, maybe towards the end, it might need some um, you know, a, a repair or, or, or full rehabilitation. Some of the uh, major concerns today with the pump stations relates to alarms and telemetry. So how does the city actually know there's a problem at the pump station? Because no one's sitting there you know, all the time. And uh, the city actually is, is working with another consultant to address this issue now, which is, which is good. You know, we identify it as part of the planning process and they're jumping on the issue and addressing it now. One of the major markers of the, the performance of the wastewater collection system is uh, sanitary sewer overflows. This is basically water that's coming out of the sewer system into the roadway and maybe getting into a drainage catch basin and ending up in the, in the Mill River, Connecticut River, what have you. And so these are, these are a concern. And these are also a concern to um, state regulators, uh, the Department of Environmental Protection, and also the EPA. Um, oftentimes, these events can put a community on sort of the watch list. Um, and so we have, over the past 10 years, the city's reported to the DEP 54 events. And I'd say on average, looking at maybe four to five events a year. And we looked at the causes, like what's causing these events. And by far, two thirds are from blockages on the system. So that's something like grease in the system, rags in the system, towels in the system. Um, and one example, the, the, the jail, um, they, they see a lot of sheets in the system and there's all that. So the city's actually gone ahead and installed a grinder that'll actually hopefully chop all that up and reduce the frequency of, of overflow related to that. The remainder of the, of the failures relate to pump station operation, a structural collapse of a pipe or a manhole, and then also wet weather events. I do want to point out the wet weather events specifically. So, so basically, a wet weather event SSO would be there's not enough capacity in the system to handle <coughs> the way all the flows that enter and enter the system. These, of these 54 events, three of them all happened at the same location, which is uh, Barrett Street, right at Barrett Street Brook. And so this is the uh, only location in the city that, that on a somewhat of a regular basis has a wet weather related sanitary sewer overflow. So we also looked again at um, an on-site wastewater needs analysis, which is basically saying the unsewered portions of the collection system. And we asked ourselves, is there a need to really extend the sewer system to these locations? And we just jumped to the results, but basically um, we found some needs of high, moderate, and low. And before, before I say anything else, what I'll, just, what I'll say is we're not recommending sewer extensions anywhere in the city. But a high need is something where uh, the soils are not great for supporting uh, a septic system. The, the lots, all the lots in Northampton are pretty big. Um, so they're not um, the, the limiting factor, but in some cases they influence uh, us to call it a, a high need. Um, but also poor soils and pump outs. So we, looked, we worked with the health department and we looked at um, how frequently does a septic tank get pumped out and when they get inspected, when you sell it, you have to get an inspection. So you do a Title V inspection. What do those look like? So we really looked at the Board of Health um, information along with soils condition, lot sizes, and determined that really um, these areas here, and also in the Northeast, uh, Coles Meadow Road and Lowell Park, these are probably ripe for, for concerns. So we don't actually have evidence of, uh, of water degradation as a result of septic issues or public health concerns as a result of septic issues. And you know, therefore, we can't really reasonably suggest extending sewers. I mean, that would be the reason why we would do it. So we can successfully tackle any uh, septic system issues on a property by property basis. So if, you have, if you're an owner of a septic system and you have an issue, you can take care of it. That's really all that we need to do. So that's predominantly the, the results of that. Um, infiltration inflow, I, I said I would define. So basically this is water that is not wastewater, it's clean water from the sky or the ground that winds up in the sewer system. 
and uh, it takes up capacity. It goes to the wastewater treatment plant, takes up capacity there, causes issues, and uh, we, we really want to minimize that to the extent cost effect, that's cost effective to do so. Um, typical sources of infiltration uh, really comes through uh, cracks in the pipe, a deteriorated manhole. Um, you know, that's basically basically it. I mean, offset joints, separated joints. These are kind of structural issues in the pipe. I was talking about the, the vitreous the vitreous pipe, clay pipe. That's like a candidate for it. tons of infiltration. Inflow comes from largely private connections. So that could be things like uh, some pumps in basements that pump into the sewer system. Maybe it's a downspout from the roof that's piped directly into the sewer system. Um, maybe there's a stormwater catch basin that is piped directly into the sewer system. You know, all of these kinds of conditions do exist in Northampton and they all contribute to inflow. So we studied both of them and um, basically what we found, which was surprising because almost every community that I studied in England has big issues with infiltration. Infiltration wasn't too bad. Um, really what we do is we, we compare the rate of infiltration against what the uh, DEP would recommend for removing it. And we really found it to be fairly acceptable. There's a couple of spots where um, the, the city should uh, plan to address it, uh, but predominantly we found inflow to be much, a much larger issue. Um, we found inflow to be pretty significant. Uh, we found it does affect performance and hydraulics through the wastewater treatment facility. And as, as an uh, example of this, on July 23, 2013, the city got two inches of rain and this is the uh, paper chart readout of the flow coming from the plant. And basically, the plant normally operates around four to five million gallons a day of flow. At the top of the chart is, is 20 million gallons a day. And this line actually went off the chart. So the city can actually record up to 22 million gallons a day. It just so happens that this, this paper chart uh, is limited to 20. So uh, the city's actually identified or recorded in excess of 22 million a day. So that's, you know, a peaking factor of five or six over what typically you get on a normal day. Um, so that's a significant amount of inflow and it does cause a lot of headaches down in the plant. This is a chart of where that inflow is predominantly coming from. Um, the red area is basically the, the King Street corridor, more or less. Um, and this has been studied in the past before Kleinfelder got involved. And, and there's been some knowledge that, that inflow is, is a concern there. And then these other areas in yellow are sort of the moderate um, inflow contributors. And then the green are, are low contributors. And then the gray are uh, small contributors. So basically, if we were to proceed with trying to eliminate inflow or reduce it to the extent that we can feasibly do, we're gonna focus on the high area first, medium area second, and low area third. And more, in all likelihood, the city will never address all the inflow in these areas because at some point, you've done enough, the plant doesn't suffer anymore, the pipes don't suffer anymore, there aren't any sanitary sewer overflows anymore, so you don't really need to invest any longer in, in inflow. I mentioned we looked at the hydraulic capacity in the collection system, so we create a computerized hydraulic model. We from that model, we basically found similar to infiltration, we were surprised and happy to find there really aren't a lot of capacity issues in the collection system, which is great. Um, and that speaks to the fact that there aren't a lot of wet weather related sanitary sewer overflows. So they all kind of agree with each other. Not a lot of SSOs, um, the capacity assessment was good, infiltration's low. So, you know, this is, these are all good, good news for uh, the collection system. Whoops. Um, we did find, again, the model uh, found Barrett Street to be an issue, and that lines up with the reporting to DEP you mentioned, so that is something that uh, definitely is gonna be on the radar for, for tackling uh, as part of this plan. So that's a quick snippet of the collection system. Obviously, if you have questions when we're done, feel free to ask me. You know, we're putting multi-year study into 40 minutes, so we have to be fast, I apologize. I'll turn over to Dan, and she'll talk about the plan. Northampton's wastewater treatment facility is located on Hockenham Road. All of the water and wastewater that ends up in the sewer system finds its way to the wastewater treatment facility. It's a major asset that the city needs to um, maintain and operate. 
The facility discharges treated wastewater to the Connecticut River, and it is subject to a National Pollutant, Elimina National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit. The plant was originally built in the 1950s as a primary treatment plant. In the 1970s, in relation to the Clean Water Act, it expanded to secondary treatment and solids processing. The last major expansion at the plant was in 1996 when odor control was added as well as um, additions to the aeration um, system as, and as well as solids processing expansion. The design flow of the plant is 8.6 million gallons per day and as Dave mentioned it's getting about four and a half million gallons per day on an average daily flow basis. Peak flows can exceed 20 million gallons per day. And that's primarily due to a rain event. Most of the, uh, the, well the plant was designed for biological oxygen demand removal and biological oxygen demand is basically a measure of the strength of the wastewater. So the plant was designed to remove BOD and TSS, which is solids in the system. The plant was not designed for nutrient removal which will become important if any nutrient uh, requirements show up in permits in the future. I'm going to show about a five minute video um, that's presented by John Carver of the ex superintendent at the wastewater treatment facility. He's going to walk through sort of the flow as it goes through the wastewater treatment facility. So hold on a moment while I pull that up. Northampton Wastewater Treatment Plant. The Northampton, Northampton Wastewater Treatment Plant has been a plant since about the 1950s as a primary plant. We put together a new treatment plant, which was an upgrade in 1981, which is basically all the equipment you see here. We have made a couple upgrades to our, our facility, but all the wastewater that comes out of the Williamsburg, Leeds, Florence, Northampton area comes down here. What here, we have here is the control panel. Right now you can see there's 4.3 million gallons of wastewater coming through the plant right now. For the pump stations, we have places throughout the city that are so low we have to pump them to get to a gravity. All the wastewater comes down here on gravity and then it has to be lifted within the plant to be able to continue out to the Connecticut River on gravity, which is about a mile, a mile from here. This is the uh, primary clarifiers. And right here in the primary, you get the quiescence. If the, the flowables come to the top, they separate from the water and with the sled sinks to the bottom. It's got a skimmer arm that collects the sc uh, scum as it comes out, goes over to this hopper right over here and collects the scum. We have to pump that at least twice a week, once a week, depending. So once we get a good load of scum, which is a lot, we, uh, we process it through a concentrator and also that goes to a landfill for uh, disposal. So as the water comes in here it's quiet as you can see what comes out under the baffle and over the soft tooth wear is a clear a clearer liquid it doesn't have the grit in it doesn't have the rocks and it doesn't have the rags in it now it's becoming a, a liquid that we can handle and we also can pump efficiently and not have too much wear and tear on our equipment because basically the biggest wear and tear in here is what's in the wastewater it could be sand it could be rocks and if you keep this stuff out of your pumps you're you're well ahead, well ahead of the game. This is the lowest part of the plant where it comes in on gravity flow. It now has to be lifted up to enable to get the water to continue on gravity to the Connecticut River. We're just conveying water from the lowest part on gravity to the next level where it goes out on gravity and into the aeration tanks. We have eight, aera eight aeration tanks online right now. Each one holds about 250,000 gallons of, uh, of liquid. We call it mixed liquor because it's mixed with microorganisms. What you have is the flow comes all the way down to these two end tanks. 
You can see the primary, primary flow, which is the food, that's from your primary tanks. And over here, that brown liquid is coming from the bottom of your secondary tanks. That's your activated sludge in your, that's reintroducing colonies back in here. This is all alive with microorganisms. So what happens here, underneath here, there's a lot of cer ceramic discs. There's about 600 ceramic discs under here, blowing air. So we add the food, the primary, we add the air, we add more colonies, and you have a living entity. So once the liquid goes through the aeration tanks, it comes out as a mixed liquor into our secondary clarifiers. That will sink to the bottom and that will form a secondary sludge, a WAS sludge. And the water coming out under the baffles and over the sawtooth wares, that will be the water that now is going to the Connecticut River. There'll be one more step to process for this water before we let it out of the plant. This is the, the final step before the, the, the Northampton wastewater effluent goes to the Connecticut River. Gets hit with chlorine as it comes around. What microorganisms that are not wanted are now being killed, pathogens, and it goes out to the Connecticut River, and by the time it gets to the Connecticut River, it's pathogen-free within the standards of EPA and DDP and ourselves, and uh, good to play in. Well, this is a laboratory in the Northampton Wastewater Treatment Plant. In here, we do sample all the different liquids you have seen during the tour, and also the cakes, the solids, and what we do is we have to abide by the EPA rules and the DDP rules. We do data on a daily basis. We, we do the pHs, we do the settled solids, we do alkalinities, and that is all done by a lab tech that comes in here. We sample various places of the treatment plant. Right here is the raw, which this is a sample of raw wastewater taken from the main line coming in, and you can see that it's kind of cloudy here, and then, and then there's a whole bunch of uh, settles in here. And we write down these numbers. This is the water coming out of your primary tanks. That's your primary sample. And this is a little cloudy, but yet it doesn't have the grit and the dirt and some of the debris in it. And this one right here is the secondary effluent, which is that's what's going to the Connecticut River right now. So I would almost willing to say that if we had a water sample next to this one, it'd be pretty hard to tell the difference. We're trying to protect and make this Northampton a, a better place to live and we'll work in and play. This is an overhead view of the wastewater treatment facility. The primary clarifier is the original plant right here, and there were also anaerobic digesters associated with that plant and a control building. The anaerobic digesters are no longer in use. Flow at the wastewater treatment facility comes from the sewer system from Hockenham Road this way and also some from across the railroad tracks. They meet up at the headworks and go through some screening and grit removal, and then the flow goes through the influent flow meter. This is the flow meter that measures that peak flows in the chart, where that only goes up to 20 million gallons per day. From there, flow is distributed to the primary clarifiers, and then it is sent to the intermediate pumps, where John was standing. From there, it's pumped up to the biological treatment tanks here, and then it is distributed to the secondary clarifiers. From there, the flow comes around through the effluent flow meter, which is located underground here. And then the flow is de uh, disinfected in the chlorination contact tanks. The effluent channel comes through here and then goes out to the Connecticut River. Sludge that's collected in the primary clarifiers and in the secondary clarifiers is pumped to the gravity thickeners where it settles out even more. And then that thickened sludge is pumped again to the sludge processing building. And then it's trucked off-site in trucks on a just about daily basis. Is it daily, Jim? It's actually 15 loads a month right now. 
penal to muscle almost every other day. The treatment plant is currently meeting all of its NIPTES permit requirements. Um, it, is, it has a requirement for um, flow to be about average at 8.6 is the limit. It's currently at 4.5, or at least it was when we did this analysis. And again, the maximum was peaking over 22. Biological oxygen demand and total suspended solids are permitted at 30 milligrams per liter. And they're both well under that requirement at almost uh, a little over nine and a little over six. A permit con special permit condition in the last permit was to opti optimize nitrogen removal and the city has met that permit condition. <clears throat> Flows have been relatively um, flat over the years because there's been limited growth in the city. So we're not predicting a large expansion needed for the treatment plan. In the future, we are expecting that there will be nutrient removal requirements at the facility. Within the 20 year planning horizon of this study, we do not anticipate a phosphorus limit in the permit. However, a nitrogen limit is anticipated. The regulatory agencies, however, are noncommittal and uncertain as to when a permit would require nitrogen removal, and when it did, what that removal requirement would be. But it is important to note that when that does happen, the treatment facility will require significant um, process changes and some new construction. So we looked at the capacity at the treatment plant, just similarly to the collection system, we have to look at the hydraulic capacity at the plant. Can the plant handle the flows that are being sent to it? Well, the plant was designed for peak flow of 14.7 MGD, but we know that flows in excess of 20 million gallons per day actually get there. Some of the specific points, hydraulic constrictions at the plant include that influent flume that can only reach to 22 million gallons per day, um, the intermediate pumps that can pump about 17 million gallons per day, or 24 million gallons per day, um, but the problem is if one of those pumps goes down, it can only pump 17. So. If they're all operating fine, it's not an issue, but if they have an issue with one going down and they get a peak full event, there could be a problem. Now, the staff has done a marvelous job in keeping things running, and that has not, to date, been an issue, but it is something that the city should keep in mind. The effluent flow meter is also another area of constriction, and sometimes the flow backs up um, into the secondary clarifier. Any future flow increases due to increases in, um, say, more infiltration or inflow or a new industry in the city um, would exacerbate any of these existing issues. We also looked at the capacity of the treatment processes themselves. We found that the solids treatment process is somewhat inadequate right now. There's limited storage capacity for sludge on site Right now, the, the solids are stored, sludge is stored in the gravity thickeners, which is not a recommended practice. Furthermore, at the time of this analysis, plant staff was working overtime to process the sludge during, for sludge dewatering uh, because they were getting a lot of solids at the time. So that was an issue when we did the analysis less of an issue for that now, but it's still a labor-intensive process that can require significant overtime. The secondary clarifiers um, are also undersized for peak flow conditions. After looking at the capacity, we looked at the condition of the facility as well. So we went on site and we walked around and looked at every asset that was there. And we considered you know, what, it, what, what the health and safety for public and workers was, was. And we also looked specifically at the mechanicals and the process controls and the processes and operations at the facility. We looked at the architectural and structural condition of the plant and the buildings there. We looked at the plumbing, the electrical, and the HVAC requirements and conditions. And we also looked at building code compliance issues. <coughs> 
Each asset was rated for condition and performance, as well as reliability and safety. And all of that was rolled up in sort of an overall priority rating. Some of the major findings of the plan are that many, many parts of many equipment um, items are actually aging to the point where they're becoming obsolete and it is difficult to find replacement parts for them. Much of the equipment is in poor to fair condition. Some of it is in good condition, but within the 20 year planning horizon of this project will become, um, approach the end of their design life. This piece of equipment is the Spick and Sludge Transfer Pump. It's an original pump that was used in the primary treatment plant to pump primary sludge. It is now being used to transfer thickened sludge from the gravity thickeners to the sludge process building. This is the only pump that is being used to do so. So the highest priority project on our list is to replace this pump with a new pump and also install um, a redundant pump as well. There were also many building issues at the facility uh, ventilation and hazardous gas monitoring needs were identified throughout. There are structural and architectural deficiencies, including a number of roofs of buildings that need to be replaced. There's also a lack of storage and maintenance space. Code issues were identified relating to the building, national fire protection, and electrical. Once all of these um, assets were rated, and identified as needing to be replaced or fixed or upgraded, we needed to identify ways to address all of them. So we developed a pool of candidate projects and then we worked with the Department of Public Works and the Board of Public, the Board of Public Works to develop a list of preferred alternatives. And those pre preferred alternatives were then developed into a capital improvement plan. Just in summary, the wastewater treatment facility had equipment and processes throughout the entire facility that need to be replaced. A lot of them are in bad condition, or in critical need of replacement, but we had to pick the highest priority items. So they touch every Every building and every process needs some work. We grouped all of these projects into um, different groups initially just to come up with an overall cost estimate of what, it, what it's going to cost to upgrade the plant in the 20 year to meet all the needs in this 20 year horizon. Oops. Uh, the building, building codes and building space costs were identified. Anything in blue here is related to the liquid treatment process train. The solids costs were all identified. And then overall general uh, processes that reach and uh, touch each of the processes at the treatment plant were also identified. When all of those were added up in 2014 dollars, the cost is over 66, $56 million. Similarly, we looked at the costs in the collection system. We identified numerous pump stations that need to be replaced and upgraded. There are some inflow issues. There's also um, some high-risk sewers that need further study and analysis. We grouped those projects into projects related to sewer system evaluation surveys and infiltration and inflow removal projects. Collections, general collection system improvement projects and pump station improvements. And in 2014 dollars, those projects totaled over $30 million. So that's a lot of work and it can't all be done tomorrow. So the next step is to really prioritize all the projects sort of that we did and combine them together and then really come up with a plan that makes sense for the next five years. So we identified a plan for the first five years of this 20 year planning horizon. We developed a schedule, we've identified some funding sources, and the next step is to implement that, that plan. It's 
it's important that the city annually revisit this plan as conditions change. <laughs> when prioritizing the projects to put in the first five years of the CIP, top of the list considers worker and public health and safety. We also looked at what the regulatory and permit drivers were, or would be in the future, any risk values that were associated with work that was done on the collection system. We looked at the agent condition of equipment at the treatment plant and in the collection system. We looked at hydraulic capacity. We looked at current standards and codes, as well as redundancy and need for redundancy in certain processes. Based on all that information, we developed three, <coughs> ma three major projects at the wastewater treatment facility and one in the collection system that are high priority projects that really should be done sooner rather than later those are the ones that we've identified for this first five years of the CIP. These projects total about $30 million. And next we're gonna have Ned come up and talk about some of the specific projects that are included in this first five years of the plan. So the first project, you know, one of the ones that we're looking at, and this actually concerns neighborhood safety as well as plant worker safety is that we had at any point up to six tons or 12,000 pounds of chlorine, gaseous chlorine on site. Um, if there was an incident or release of it, it would probably trigger an evacuation in neighborhood. And what we're looking at doing is replacing it with sodium hypochlorite, which is a liquid, basically it's a strong liquid bleach. Um, we use that currently at the wastewater treatment plant, or the water treatment plant up in Williamsburg as a disinfectant. <coughs> Uh, the switchgear generator, generator being here on the left, the switchgear on the right, uh, that was installed in 1978. It could run the bare bones of the plant, but it can't do any kind of sludge processing or water control. So if the plant went down for an extended period of time, more than two or three days, we're losing the ability to process our sludge and manage that appropriately. In addition, there needs to be an automatic transfer of power when the power went off on the, on the switchgear, now has to be manually done. Uh, the switch here is obsolete, you can't find parts for it, and part of the recommendation of the 5-year plan is to upgrade the generator to do all the plant needs and also replace the switch gear. Uh, these return activated sludge pumps, this is a recent story that's happened. Um, a few months ago, one of the pumps failed. We brought it to a local uh, mechanical shop for repair. They had a lot of trouble finding the parts for it. During that time that they were looking for parts, a second pump failed. And out of the four pumps, there's three per operations, one for redundancy. We're down to two pumps at the station now. It's going to take probably another month or two to get those two pumps back, but that's one of the priorities in the five-year plan, is to replace these older pumps from 1978 and the motors and upgrade them all to new current standards. Uh, the aeration control valves, um, there's eight tanks at the plant that was described earlier by John Carver in the video, and each one of those flow between each other with a series of gates. And what's happened over time, the concrete has been exposed to the environment and with all the twisting of the gates and the anchors, they're slowly starting to pull out of the concrete wall. And because of it, the plant operators are having trouble controlling the process and be able to move the liquid around between the tanks. That's another major project in the five-year plan is to replace the gates, the valves, and the anchors and get them re-secured again. Uh, the water sludge uh, equipment and conveyance. This is part of a newer installation in 1996. But what we're finding out is that the two belt filter presses we have there are obsolete. Uh, the trouble having finding parts for them. And they're basically a, a maintenance and safety nightmare. One of the things that's happening right now with these uh, filter presses is that all the computer programs run through a control panel. And because of the corrosion in this particular area of the plant, the control panel keeps alarming out and won't run the presses. So staff have to manually override the control panel to process sludge at this point. So with this new equipment, we replace all the dewatering equipment, we move water equipment, and also underneath is the sludge conveyance system, which is basically a big screw, con uh, big screw conveyance system that runs on the roof of the building, and, um, or the ceiling, I should say. And what it does, it moves all the waste to the central hoppers, down to the disposal units. And what happens is that if anything goes wrong with the upper screw conveyor, 
you have to detach all the lower screw conveyors off of it, and it's just a maintenance nightmare to get to, and it could put the plant down for days if something went wrong with it. Back over. So in summary, over the next 20 years, we estimated about $87 million in investments will be needed at the wastewater treatment facility and in the collection system. The first five years of the capital improvement plan <coughs> contains about $30 million of prior high priority projects. And the focus of those projects is on the wastewater treatment facility and in um, the pump stations. Years six through 20, of the CIP are about $57 million in projects. It's important that the city revisit and update the CIP annually to account for changes in re the regulatory environment and also in equipment condition. For instance, um, we didn't know that the return activated sludge pumps were going to fail now. They were in the five-year plan, but if we had known they were gonna fail, we could have put them first year content. So things are gonna shift over time. So that's something that's going to be required to be uh, revisited continuously by the city. So how is this all going to be funded? That's the big question, right? Um, well, the Sewer Enterprise Fund funds wastewater treatment plant and collection system projects. It's primarily funded through user rate fees. It's also possible to fund Sewer Enterprise and to feed the the fund with betterment and sewer connection fees and with developer fees, but that's not a large percentage right now of what's feeding that account. The city can borrow through municipal bonds and has a very good rating, so that's a, a way to get cash that would then need to be paid back. There are also many grant and loan, few grant loan and rebate programs, uh, but most likely the city's going to have to borrow money and, and pay it back. There were uh, many people in the city that helped with this project, and we thank them all. And at this time, we can take any questions that people didn't get a chance to ask during the rest of the presentation. Uh, the report, the complete report, is it available online or PDF available that can be read? We are. Um, Finishing the executive summary now, which we have a draft of, or is available right there. The complete report is in review, um, and I actually have a timeline where it will be totally available, but hopefully this year. The, the entire report will be posted at some point. It's pretty voluminous. It's probably, about, it's probably about a foot and a half thick of paperwork. <laughs> We're planning to have hard copies of the Lilly and Forge libraries, as well as key offices in the city, like the Department of Public Works. More than likely, the mayor's office would have a copy and other copies of other, other departments in the city that people could come and see a hard copy. We're also going to post it online <coughs> in sections. So if you want to read on the task number six, which is the study of the plant itself, you could peel that off as a PDF and read it electronically also. One of the things of finalizing the plan is that we're trying to do the executive summary now and finalize it, but it's also going to depend on public comment and also reviewing concurrence from the DEP and following with the Massachusetts Environmental Protection, uh, Protection Agency uh, for basically permitting for the future some of the work we want to do. So it's still got a couple of processes to go through, but the majority of it, we're, we're going to post the presentation tomorrow and the executive summary. Um, trying to finish that up tonight. And I was met in the next few months that we'll start, start seeing these tasks being put online. And at the end of it, when it's all completed, there'll be full volumes and hard copy available for reading at various places in the city. Mm. Yes, I just sort of planned it out that planning can use laser tissue, put all these documents on so that we can public, because I know there's a lot of people out there that really get into the minutia of it mm -hmm. to review it, and it's not easy for them to go to the PW or the other facilities to look at hard copy during business hours. So I I think that would be a pretty high priority okay. so the public could make an intelligent decision about this. Okay, thank you. Ms. Yes, Ned. What you presented tonight 
Would you have a copy of that available? Tomorrow, I would like post it up on the council. I think that is very helpful. Do you, uh, Marian, did you mean uh, the video? No. Or the whole presentation? So the whole presentation will be online tomorrow. If you want the video link, it's just to be a the slide that was there, you're going to have to cut and paste that because that's coming from YouTube. Okay. So there'll be a link to it that you can cut and paste and then watch that video again and again if you want. Yeah. Okay. Good. And then also, uh, where is the solid waste truck to? Waterbury, Connecticut. What it's incinerated. incinerated. Waterbury, Connecticut, where it's incinerated. And are they able to produce energy from that fire? Um, I'm not familiar with all that they have set up down there. So I don't know for sure. Then have we been trucking it down there for a long time? I think this is the second year that we've been trucking it down there. Right before that, it was going to Moortown, Vermont landfill for a number of years. Uh, before that, it was uh, Blackstone Valley incineration out there. So we have a, basically a three-year contract we have for sludge disposal, and it goes to the responsible low bidder, and they give us a list of sites, permanent sites, where it's going to. Thank you. And then also you mentioned Williamsburg, but was that in context of the uh, Mountain Street Reservoir up there? We don't treat Williamsburg's wastewater, do we? Yes, we do. We do. There is a 10 so sewer line that comes down River Road, that's their main trunk line from their community. Um, and it comes to our plant, and they pay us a fee for treatment, um, like using the user rates would pay. Does Williamsburg pay Northampton for that? Yes. And uh, one more question. Do the, uh, this facility down here, do the pumps and so forth run 24-7? or at just certain times during the day? No, every pump runs 24 seven, like the intermediate pump that lifts it from the primary clarifiers up to the aeration. There's actually three large pumps and a small jockey pump there. So that as flows go up, more pumps go on, they go off, and they actually rotate also. So they all try to have the same wear on them. So we don't have one pump running all the time and two lagging behind. So we try to keep the hours of the pumps similar to each other. And then for small incremental flows, there's called a jockey pump. That, so we want to turn on one of the big pumps. We can handle it with a big pump and a small jockey pump. There's other pumps, um, like the sludge transfer pump. It doesn't run continuously, but it runs. All the pumps run it basically every single day. Thank you. Lisa? Um, I'm curious about the anaerobic digesters. Were they originally used to process the sludge? And is there any um, thought about kind of re, uh, reinstating that process, bringing them up to some kind of code or replacing them as a, so that we can keep the sludge sure. locally and process it for energy purposes? Yeah, the, the digesters were actually a major feature of our study. Um, they were, I think the, the, the short, answer is that they're too small um, and they were always too small from day one. Um, the city did attempt to run them and uh, they were a nightmare to actually utilize. Um, so we, we did look at the study at um, what it would take to uh, basically uh, rehabilitate those digesters and put them back online and how they would perform. Um, and ultimately we determined the payback to do that. You couldn't, you couldn't make a sound business case basically to put them back online. Um, but at the end of the day, because they're still too small. Can I follow up to that? Yeah. Can they be repurposed um, for other, I know this is kind of beyond the scope of what we're talking about here, but is there a possibility that they can be repurposed for um, digestion and other things that can be brought in, restaurant scraps and all that kind of stuff, or is it not? Um, well, they were repurposed but not for digestion. So they, they were the purpose for uh, sludge storage. And there was, uh, they added aeration to them to keep the odors down. Um, but that, what year did that process stop? Do you remember that? Yeah. Stop using that storage. Yeah. That process didn't last too long because 
unfortunately, the odor control system uh, wasn't strong enough to draw out all the odors. Yep. And as it was aerated, it was basically inundating the neighborhood. Sure. There sure. all kinds of offensive odors, so we put them offline yep. fairly fast. So I, you know, we recognize that um, there are a lot of uh, waste streams out there that have a lot of energy value to them. So one of them being fats, oils, and grease that get collected in restaurant traps. Um, another one, which is, uh, you know, the, the state has recently passed a law to make this uh, food waste a very, uh, I guess, valuable waste stream to go into places to create energy. Um, we basically, in the study, we looked at that. Um, could Northampton serve as some sort of uh, a host facility for uh, fats, oil, and grease, and, and, and um, food waste. Basically, at the end of the day, the facility is, is too tight. Um, it's not going to generate, you know, much energy. You know, it's a small digester. Um, it would increase local truck traffic, you know, fivefold. Um, so there are a lot of disadvantages to it, um, and I don't think the payback is really there. But we really didn't study it very far. Um, it, there is potential maybe for further study on it, but really this, this particular study didn't take it to the, to the end. Um, we do recognize, uh, due to the, the new uh, food waste stream, uh, the value of that, there may be in Western Mass new facilities that pop up. Uh, we're aware of a couple that were under, under feasibility studies. Um, Northampton may have a future alternative option for processing their solids that they're doing today. Um, it's just not available yet, so it's, it's something that um, I think our study sort of concluded that there could be future options. Um, we want to make we want to make the process as safe, as efficient, and cost effective as we can given the constraints and the size of the facility that there is today. So, yep. Yes. Um, looking at study, there's quite a bit of these streets around my board in Ward 6, which is Turkey Hill Road, and we stated it was four soils, Lawrence Road, Maple Ridge, four soil, and pump outs, Winterberry Lane, and then you had Park Hill Road, Greenleaf, four soil, and pump outs. Then you had Autumn Drive, and I think Fairway, wasn't that also included in that? I think so, I figured, yep. What about Austin Circle because of all the flooding and so forth that we have in that area? Was that looked at? That's all sewer. Yeah, so I'd be challenged to know exactly where Austin Circle was off my head. That's, that's by the Rhinewood School. It's all sewer. That's yeah. all sewer. So there's no, as far as I know, there might be a few on site disposal systems left in that neighborhood, but the vast majority of are connected to the sewer now. Great, thank you for your time tonight, and uh, please don't forget we're having a second viewing of this presentation on September 30th at 6.30 p.m. in the community room at JFA School on 100 Bridge Road. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.